Ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to today's webinar. I'm John James and I'm your host for today's event. The technology we're using today is really easy to use. Here's an image of the GoToWebinar floating control panel. It's fully expanded when you first join, but the clever little thing hides itself after a couple of minutes uh, and becomes this skinny floating toolbar. Um, and it does that so that you can better concentrate on the presentation. Uh, now, if you would um, like to expand it again, all you need to do is click on the little orange arrow here and it'll expand out again so you can see all the panels. Now, to watch today's webinar, you're probably sitting in front of your computer. However, if you wanted, you could be watching on your mobile device, whether it be an iPad or an Android tablet. The catch, however, is that you can watch and listen, but you can't actually raise your hand, vote in a poll, or type in a question. Sorry about that. Hopefully they'll upgrade that feature soon. Now, to listen to today's webinar, you can either use your computer's mic and speakers or a telephone. Now, we've had a few issues with the computer audio in the past, so if it gets too annoying for you when it breaks up, you can just swap over and use the telephone at any time. We do provide a toll-free number, so it won't cost you any more. Now, if you do need to swap over, you just expand your floating control panel and you come to the little audio panel here and instead of the radio button here for mic and speakers, you just click the telephone and then you enter the details that are on your screen. Don't enter the ones on mine because uh, we all get personalised um, invitations. Uh, now, folks, you can interact with us today by raising your electronic hand, which is just at the bottom of the little skinny bar here. Um, and you can also type questions in the Q&A panel down the bottom here. Now, only the organisers get to see your hand or what you type. And if you do ask a question, I'll read it out so it's anonymous. So, hey, folks, let's practice. Um, if you can hear me clearly, can you please raise your hand? Fantastic. Okay, great to see that we've got a live audience. Now, if you just click on the hand again, it'll lower it. Just a, a easy toggle switch. Great. Now, to get the most out of today's presentation, I suggest you turn off your email and mobile phones and tune into what our presenter is saying. Take some notes as we go along and jot questions as they come to mind and then type them into the question panel uh, at the bottom of the screen there. Today's presentation is being recorded for you to view afterwards, so don't worry if you don't catch every word. I'll send you the link to that and also the presentation slides uh, within the next day or so. But it's great that you've been able to join us live for this webinar, as that way you'll be able to ask the presenter the questions that you want answered. So folks, I'm curious to um, know where you're from today. So here's a quick poll. Can you now just indicate where you're normally located? That's great. I can see most people have gotten the idea here now. So I'll just close it off in three, two, one. Great. And I'll share those results with you. Okay. So it's uh, no big surprise that um, over two-thirds of our audience are from Queensland and about a third are from Northern Territory. So folks, it's great to have you all here. And of course, if there's anyone else from other places that aren't listed there, just type it into the little chat box so I can see where you're from. Okay, so that's great. So I'll just ask one more question of you. Um, so if I were to go to the next page here, so, of course, today's webinar is focusing on this book, The Phosphorus Management of Beef Cattle in Northern Australia. So, I'm curious to know, um, have you actually obtained the book yet? So, perhaps you have and you've read it already, or perhaps you have and you've yet to read it, or maybe you haven't but you will soon, or no, and you don't really intend to, which is fine. So, folks, please indicate on the poll there. That's good. I can see most people have got the hang of this now. So I'll close it in a few seconds. So three, two, and one. Fantastic. Okay. So I can see that, yes, naturally enough, the uh, majority don't have it, but they will soon. And by the way, I um, just placed my order with MLA last week, and I got it within like three or four days. So they're very quick at being able to send it out. So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, 
So that helps our presenter today to um, know the audience that we're talking about. Okay, so here we go. So I'm just in the process now of changing the screen for the presenter. So in a moment, we'll be hearing from our um, guest presenter today. Now, she is originally from Canada, but has since worked at Richmond in northwest Queensland and at Swans Lagoon Research Station prior to coming to Longreach. There she's, she has a dual role as a scientist and extension officer. She was the project leader and one of the authors for the recently released book, Phosphorus Management of Beef Cattle in Northern Australia. She has been heavily involved in the delivery of the Breeding Edge and Nutrition Edge workshop packages across Queensland. She is passionate about rangeland and beef cattle research and is committed to extension activities that help pastoralists achieve a more profitable business. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Desiree Jackson to our webinar today. Thanks for joining us, Desiree. Over to you. Thanks, John, and thank you everybody for taking the time to um, listen in today. Um, there are a few slides that I, I need to go through, so I'll, um, I'll uh, uh, move, get started and, and move along. Okay, uh, th this book was initiated by Meat Livestock Australia. Uh, a few years ago we had a phosphorus forum in Townsville and if there's one nutritional issue that seems to be fairly contentious in the beef industry amongst researchers and uh, extension officers, that, that seems to be phosphorus. And we realized that we needed to have a really consistent approach in our advice to uh, the beef industry and also to update the information that we had on phosphorus management since the Winks and McCosker was put out in 1994. The team consisted of staff, beef extension and research staff from Queensland, Northern Territory and Western Australia. So uh, staff from Queensland included myself, Rob Dixon, who was also involved in the literature review on phosphorus, uh, which he conducted with David Coates. Bill Holmes, who was the economist and did all of the economics for the case studies. Bernie English and Joe Rolfe up at Mariba and Beck Matthews at Con Curry. We also had Peter Smith in Western Australia, and he's now in, back in Charters Towers, and Neil McDonald from the Northern Territory. And this book uh, couldn't have been produced without the efforts of Ian Partridge, who um, did a fantastic job of uh, taking that information and putting it into a format that's very easy to read and uh, easy to reference. So it, it's a quick guide where you'll be able to um, look something up uh, specifically and, and find that information quite quite readily. So the, the book couldn't have been put together without Ian's help and, and it was also funded by Meat and Livestock Australia. The aims of the book uh, were to uh, provide the latest recommendations for phosphorus feeding, so those have been refined somewhat, um, to compile scientific and practical knowledge. So there were some uh, outcomes from the phosphorus literature review that have been distilled in, and put into this book. There's also been a new method for testing phosphorus, that being uh, fecal phosphorus testing in conjunction with our quality analysis. And we also wanted to include regionally specific producer case studies, uh, where previously the, the case studies seemed to be concentrated in specific areas. We wanted to have uh, case studies from quite a number of uh, different regions so that they ha would have local relevance for producers in those areas. So why feed phosphorus? Well, we're all conscious that we need to feed phosphorus for animal performance and that it's uh, required for growth. It's required for fertility and improving reconception rates and for milk production, which obviously has the spin-off of reducing age at turnoff and, and what those in the soil, that being peg leg, poor body condition score and botulism. Poor body condition score and botulism can be attributed to, to other nutritional deficiencies such as protein and energy as well. So we need to hone in and, and figure out wh what's causing that particular problem. And hopefully we don't get to the point where we start to see some of those signs. Some of the hidden effects, or one in particular, is reduced feed intake. And this is quite significant because we've got that window of opportunity during the wet season to capitalize on production by supplying phosphorus where it's deficient. And if we don't, 
um, and the feed's quite digestible at that time of year, it can have a significant impact on on feed intake by cattle. And, and obviously, if feed intake's depressed and the animals aren't eating as much protein and energy and we just lose some of that production, and it might not be obvious because we see those animals still going forward. The other, yeah, the other effect, as I've mentioned, is that um, the growth isn't quite as good in the wet either. So we'll see those animals going forward, but um, not nearly um, close to the potential that uh, they could be if, if a bit of phosphorus were added to the diet where it is deficient. So when do we need to feed phosphorus? Well, where there's a deficiency, we need to feed it all year. Animals uh, uh, require phosphorus for just about every metabolic activity in the body, so it's required all the time. And we need to be supplying phosphorus to the animal all year, whether that comes from the diet or whether it comes from a supplement. And we need to ramp it up during the wet season, and I'll explain why in, in, in a bit. And so that means we obviously need to adjust the phosphorus level in the supplements as well. Oh, John, over to you. Yes, okay, folks. So here's um, another quick poll. So if you are on phosphorus deficient country, how often do you feed wet season phosphorus supplements? So is it always, frequently, sometimes, rarely, or never? So if you can um, quickly think about that and make your selection. That's great. I can see lots of people are getting into this now. So I'll close it off in three, two, one. Excellent. So I'll just share those results with you all now. So it's good to see that, OK, so um, about a third of the people, Desiree, are saying that they always do it. 14% um, are saying frequently. And then another third are saying sometimes. Um, and a small number have said rarely or never. OK, that's good. Thanks, John. Um, so um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, for those of you that um, don't always feed phosphorus where it might be required, I might be convinced that that's the way to go. So what stock need phosphorus most? Well, young growing, growing animals obviously need phosphorus for, uh, for skeletal growth, and, and they're also growing very rapidly. Our first calf heifers obviously need uh, phosphorus for their own growth, both skeletal and, and weight gain and development of the fetus as well as milk production. And then we've also got the added pressure of trying to ensure that they start cycling soon after calving. Late pregnant breeders have a high requirement for phosphorus because of rapid fetal growth. So a lot of phosphorus is being diverted into, into fetal growth. And wet cows, of course, have a very high requirement for phosphorus due to lactation. Now here's a map of um, northern Australia. So we're looking at uh, a country covering Western Australia, Northern Territory in Queensland. This map uh, was produced by Winks and McCosker in the previous book. And it shows that about 70% of Northern Australia is phosphorus deficient. And that figure could be slightly higher. All of the red shaded areas are areas that are acutely deficient, the areas that are yellow are marginally deficient or mixed. Now what we've changed in this map since it was last produced uh, for the previous book was that the green shaded areas were assumed to be adequate, um, where now we know that uh, in some cases we have pockets in, in those green areas where phosphorus has been tested as being deficient, either through the soil or through fecal phosphorus testing. These maps were produced based on, on vegetation types, and those vegetation types are listed in the appendix of the book. So there was the assumption, for example, in the green shaded areas that where we have Mitchell grass country, all of that phosphorus is, uh, all of that country is P adequate, and that's not necessarily the case. And we certainly found quite a number of areas where phosphorus is quite deficient on, on Downs country. And in Queensland specifically, um, it's well documented that the Barclay tablelands are phosphorus deficient. So who should feed? Well, the first way to assess whether you know, phosphorus needs to be supplemented to animals is to have a look to see if there's any historical records on soil analyses that might have been done for, for your property. Any 
uh, soils that are 5 milligrams of phosphorus or less per kilogram of, of soil are uh, acutely deficient or a severe deficiency and all cattle will respond to a phosphorus supplement and those animals must be supplemented all year round. When the soil P levels uh, go to 6 to 8 milligrams of phosphorus, then young breeders are going to be the class of animals that are most likely to respond to a supplement and we recommend that other animals be tested to look at the balance between phosphorus and other nutrients or to look at the dietary phosphorus status of the animal uh, as an indicator of whether there would be a response to supplementing that animal. Where the soil P levels are, are more than 8, then the, the um, soils deem to be phosphorus adequate. Now where it gets a little bit tricky is if a paddock has a mixture of land, land types or soil types and we can get quite a bit of variation. So even though a particular paddock might be mapped out, um, if we have a mixture of, of land types or soil types, um, such as frontage country mixed in with spinifex, for example, or mulga country and channel country mixed in together, then you're going to get a fair bit of uh, range in the soil P levels. And we need to know a little bit about um, the behavior, the grazing behavior of those cattle and where they're spending their time. And in that situation, we're probably better off actually um, sampling the animal. And I'll talk about that shortly as well. The other thing we can look at is if we're coming into a new area, and, and a lot of properties have changed hands, and people mightn't be aware that uh, phosphorus might be required for a particular land type because it mightn't look typically phosphorus deficient. So starting with regional vegetation types, um, that might be a, a bit of a red flag that a particular uh, pasture might be phosphorus deficient, but it's certainly not the place to stop. Uh, further testing would be required. Looking for signs of phosphorus deficiency as well. So, you know, if we're seeing things like peg leg and botulism and broken bones and poor performance, then um, it definitely points to a phosphorus deficiency and hopefully things don't get that far. Um, speaking to, to neighbors about um, any historical records or any history of a phosphorus deficiency on, on the property or neighboring properties, speaking to uh, feed suppliers who may have supplied um, licks licks to those particular properties. Um, looking at some soil maps, so some of the um, uh, Department of Agriculture offices or DPR offices across Western Australia, Northern Territory, Queensland will have um, soil maps done for a particular area, so it'd be worthwhile finding out if there's any information available on your property. Um, and speaking to your beef advisor or, or consultant about um, whether any, you know, the type of testing that might be best for your particular situation. If you have country that's um, marginal and you're wanting to know whether there would be a response, then um, trial feeding might be the way to go and probably the best group to start with would be your first calf cows, which would have the highest phosphorus requirement. So if you're going to get a response, that will be the group most likely that you'll, you'll get a response in. And finally, uh, Getting diagnostic tests done, so looking at um, sampling the animal to find out what its dietary phosphorus status would, would be the most definitive way to, to find out whether an animal is deficient or not. Okay, um, in the past, I've, I've mentioned that with the diagnostic test we can go and get soil samples done. <clears throat> it's very critical that the soil sampling is done correctly uh, so that we're getting an accurate analysis for that particular soil type. Uh, quite a number of samples need to be done and we also need to soil map all of the areas that cattle are grazing in. So it might involve quite a number of soil types within a paddock and quite a number of samples. And we strongly recommend that if, if that's a track you'd like to go down and it's certainly worthwhile to get a really accurate um, analysis of, of the soil status, phosphorus status then um, that you enlist somebody who's got expertise in soil sampling to do that. And it's certainly not um, um, a cheap way to, to get an analysis done. In the past, a lot of people sent forage samples in or pasture samples in. Um, while the actual test itself is very accurate for measuring the phosphorus level, and about 75% of that phosphorus measured in the plant is available to the animal for absorption, and while that's quite accurate, it doesn't actually reflect what the animals are grazing. So what animals graze in the morning isn't what 
they're going to be grazing later on in the day. So they're, they're just as discerning as, as what we are as humans. Um, we don't eat cereals in the morning because they taste good normally. We eat them to fill up, and cattle are pretty much the same way. Once they fill up, they start to get fairly discerning about what they eat. So, um, and, and that's going to vary from week to week depending on what's available. And it's also going to be very much uh, a seasonal thing as well. So, and the other issue, of course, is that um, we have to know what part of the plant they're selecting because there's huge variations between uh, phosphorus levels in, in stems versus leaves, for example. So it, it's not a, a good representation of the phosphorus status of the animal or what that phosphorus status is likely to be. The most accurate test that we can carry out is, is doing a, a blood, blood phosphorus test. This has to be done at the end of the wet season. <laughs> if we have an endemic phosphorus deficiency on our property, then it's likely due to um, um, it, it's likely to be picked up during the wet season when protein energy levels are still quite high and phosphorus is low. Phosphorus tends to decline um, uh, along with protein, so they're, they're strongly correlated to each other. So if, if protein's decreasing, then phosphorus is also going to be decreasing. So if, if you get a phosphorus deficiency during the dry season, while it, it's telling us that phosphorus is deficient in the diet, it's not telling us anything about uh, what the overall phosphorus status is for that property. And we really need to find out what the status is during the wet season because that's where we're going to get the, the biggest return on the money spent feeding phosphorus. So blood testing at the end of the wet season and dry stock um, only, so no pregnant or, or wet cattle should be uh, tested, only dry stock. Um, and I guess it, it hasn't really been taken up well by industry for practical reasons. Uh, most people aren't really mustering for branding uh, at the end of the wet season. And also it, it, it involves having to muster and bloods need to be spun down, kept cool, and, and then sent away for analysis. It's certainly worthwhile as a once-off if, if you just want to establish uh, whether your animals have, have a phosphorus deficiency during the wet, um, but it's not practical in terms of being able to continually monitor those animals. What's become much more popular is, is doing fecal phosphorus analyses as an indication of dietary phosphorus status. The best time to sample, once again, is during the middle of the wet season, and uh, sometimes it's not practical to uh, get out into the paddock if, it, if it's too wet, but at least it doesn't involve mustering animals up and samples can be collected uh, where cattle are camped at, at lunchtime. And, and again, the reason we test during the wet season is because this is when protein energy are at their peak. So we would expect that where there isn't an, an endemic phosphorus deficiency, that phosphorus levels would be higher as well. So if they're low at that time of year, then phosphorus is an issue for that property or for that paddock. Um, Animals need to be unsupplemented at the time of sampling uh, for at least one week, preferably two. So what uh, some properties have done is um, they put out a lot of phosphorus lake at the start of the wet season. Um, they mightn't be able to get out to their stock because it's too wet. And when they go out to, to put more phosphorus out um, a bit later on the wet season after the animals have run out for a while, that's when they go and collect the sample and get a phosphorus analysis done. Uh, it's also used to look at the ratio between um, phosphorus and, and energy. So if the energy level is higher in the diet, then uh, we're going to get a good response to supplementing phosphorus. So it gives us an, a good indication of what the likely response is going to be from putting out a phosphorus supplement. If energy is low in the diet, then the response to feeding phosphorus is also going to be reduced as well. So we need to look at the balance. John, I'll just stop there. Great, okay, thanks for that Desiree. So that's the first of your three um, segments. So we've got a question uh, or two here. So the first one is, um, which phosphorus test was used for the soil analysis? Uh, that was a bicarbonate test. Okay, thank you. Um, and regarding Mitchell grassland, can you tell us, that, that, does it all have adequate levels of phosphorus? Uh, no, it doesn't, John. Uh, some of the areas um, that we have tested in Queensland uh, where we have pockets of uh, phosphorus deficiencies are uh, north of Cloncurry, north of Julia Creek, uh, north of Aramac, 
and um, uh, more recently, uh, I found um, phosphorus deficiency actually between Longreach and Isersford, which was quite surprising, and also uh, south of Longreach as well. So there, there are a few pockets around around Queensland where phosphorus is deficient. Okay, thanks Desiree. Um, that's all the questions for the moment. So, so folks, if you do have further questions or comments, just type them in that little Q&A box at the bottom. But back to you now, Desiree. Okay. The next segment is going to be on how much do we actually need to feed to the animals. So I'll just talk about some of the dietary factors and the animal factors. And then I'll also speak a, a little bit about um, how we go about putting together a lick for our particular situation. So if we focus on the animal, first of all, we need to look at what the animal requirements are. Um, I'll talk about bone mobilization shortly, but um, first of all, we need to look at the class of animal that we're supplementing. Uh, are, we, are we supplementing a wiener that's got rapid, rapid growth? Are we supplementing a first calf cow that's wet or a mature cow that's wet? Because there will be differences in their requirements. Are we supplementing a wet cow that's gaining weight or one that's actually losing weight? Are we supplementing a breeder that's an early lactation or late lactation because their requirements will differ as well? And similarly for pregnancy, those breeders that are heavily um, pregnant are going to have higher phosphorus requirements than those breeders that are early in calf. Also, we need to look at um, you know what's a realistic level of, of growth for our particular property. So if we've got a um, country that's uh, very, uh, very good in terms of protein energy levels, then there's more scope for uh, putting condition on those animals, so those animals will be able to utilize more phosphorus. So we need to hone in a little bit on, um, you know, what are the requirements and, and what sort of level of production can we realistically expect from those animals and when are we likely to turn them off. And now on the issue of bone mobilization, um, we often don't think about, uh, we think about supplementing the animals and we often don't think about animals relying on uh, bone phosphorus as a source of phosphorus. And where this has been utilized well is on properties where uh, people put out a fairly significant amount of phosphorus at the start of the wet season, knowing that they won't be able to get out during the wet because it's just um, just far too boggy to, to get around and, and top up the uh, phosphorus supplement in the paddock. If the animals are bone replete or have high phosphorus levels in their bone and soft tissue, um, that being muscle, then they can draw on those uh, bone phosphorus reserves to um, meet their phosphorus requirement. Um, initially that uh, uh, the bone mobilization will start off uh, quite rapid and, and it will begin to decline as, as time goes on and the bone reserves become depleted. And just to give you an example, if we, we had a breeder that weighed about 400 kilograms, she's got about three three kilograms of phosphorus in her body if she's bone replete. So if she's got the full amount of phosphorus she can possibly carry in her bones. She'll be able to draw between 20 and 30 percent of that phosphorus if she becomes severely deficient. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is helpful towards the end of the wet season when people can't get out to put phosphorus out for their animals. And it'll just uh, allow those animals to be able to maintain productivity by drawing on bone phosphorus. We certainly don't recommend doing this for the long term. And the other thing that we need to consider is that those animals actually need to put phosphorus back into the bone again as well. Uh, and there are different ways of, of addressing that. The other thing we need to be conscious of is if we allow the bone reserves uh, be, to become too depleted, then the animal is going to be at risk of bro uh, bone breakages. And we've certainly had some cases of that with younger stock. Um, in, in, on properties uh, where animals have been put through yards and uh, they've broken bones and not through vigorous handling but just simply because they've had a deficiency at, at a time where their skeletal growth was quite rapid. If we look at the diet, well first and foremost we need to look at the level of phosphorus in the diet per se and I've, I've spoken about um, some of the tests that we can do. So if we look at um, a fecal phosphorus test for example, or a blood test that will give us an indication of um, the phosphorus status of the animal. Um, we also need to look at what the level is of other nutrients. So if we've got an, um, an extreme phosphorus deficiency, there's no point in feeding a big heap of phosphorus if protein and energy are deficient because the animal or the, the rumen microbes can't utilize all that phos uh, phosphorus to, to process the feed if, 
there isn't enough energy and protein coming into the diet. So some of that will become wasted. Some of that will actually go into bone deposition, but some of that will become wasted. Um, or conversely, if, if an animal has um, a high protein energy intake, dietary intake, then it's able to um, utilize more phosphorus so we can adjust those phosphorus levels upwards. So it's important to actually look at individual nutrients, but we also have to be very conscious about trying to balance those nutrients with each other. And then um, if we're formulating a lick to ensure that the lick that we're providing those animals is balanced with uh, what's, what's coming into the diet. And that's when it's very helpful, you know, if you have that information on hand and you're dealing with your feed company to be able to give them that information uh, so that they can have a better idea of what's happening on your property when they're putting together your licks. So how much phosphorus do we need to put in our lake? And it's a question I often get asked. Um, obviously, during the wet season, we're going to have much higher levels of phosphorus. So you know, a typical um, phosphorus level would be 8 to 10 percent phosphorus, which would equate to about 40 to 50 percent uh, calcium phosphate in, in the um, in the lick. During the dry season, we're going to be feeding much lower levels of phosphorus, so maybe somewhere around the 2 to 4 percent. Um, it's going to also vary with a number of other things. So if if the uh, lick that we're providing the animals um, is very palatable, then we can get away with including a much lower level of phosphorus because uh, the animal is going to be eating more supplement. And the last thing we want to do is to be wasting phosphorus because it's the dearest ingredient that we put into our licks. We also, um, if we're looking at feeding um, blocks, for example, um, phosphorus blocks, uh, are, are often uh, manufactured for wet season feeding because they're weatherproof. Uh, that means that they're quite hard. So animals usually have lower intakes of blocks than what they might from a lick. So uh, we need to have higher phosphorus levels in those in those blocks. So palatability and hardness are um, two real driving factors for uh, the level of uh, the inclusion rates, and and then of course um, what the requirements are for that particular animal. So the types of licks that um, that obviously are available are loose licks, and quite a number of people I know use loose licks. Um, blocks are also used to, to a fair degree, particularly during the wet season, and particularly on properties where people can't get out to replenish um, phosphorus supplements uh, midway through the wet season. There are some properties that are using uh, water medication to supply phosphorus quite successfully, and one of the case studies from my region in the Jericho area uses a, uses water medication quite successfully. And it's also important that if you are feeding bulk energy supplements, um, for example, fortified molasses, that if you have a phosphorus deficiency, that some phosphorus is included in that supplement as well. OK, so how do we calculate lick costs? Um, once we start putting a, a lot of phosphorus into our supplements, the price is going to um, rise quite dramatically, and that's because phosphorus is, is quite an expensive ingredient. So looking at the cost per ton of a particular supplement is probably not the best indicator of, of um, the level of economy of a particular supplement. What we really need to look at is how much is it costing us to actually supply that particular nutrient. When we're supplementing licks, um, uh, loose licks and blocks in particular, we're supplementing that animal with either two things. We're either providing them with minerals, and most specifically phosphorus. Um, obviously, if we're on the basalt, we'd be looking at sulfur as well. But in this particular case, we'd be looking at phosphorus. Or we're supplying that animal um, with urea. So that's the nutrient we actually need to work out the cost on if, if we're wanting to do a, um, a lick cost comparison, for example. So I've just got an example here uh, of a typical cost of supplement which would be $750 a ton. And let's say, for example, the phosphorus content of that supplement was 5%. We know then that um, in 1,000 kilograms or a ton of that supplement, we've got 50 kilograms of phosphorus. If it's costing us $750 a ton for the supplement, it's costing us $750 for 50 kilograms of phosphorus because there's 50 kilograms of phosphorus in a ton of that supplement. And if we calculate that out, that's going to cost us $15 per kilo of phosphorus. Or if we want to work that out on a, on a daily basis, um, we can say, well, it's going to cost us one and a half cents per, 
for a gram of phosphorus. And if we were feeding um, wet cows, for example, during the wet season and we're wanting to get 10 grams of phosphorus, Another ingredient that's used, and some, sometimes people uh, bulk at putting too much of this ingredient in, in the, and that's salt, because they see that there's not much nutritive value. Animals do have some requirement for salt on, on tropical pastures, where we don't have high salt levels um, or, or saline water. And uh, um, salt is very effective at being able to control intake. So while it doesn't contribute a lot to the nutritive value of of the diet is quite effective at controlling intake or on some country it's used to actually encourage animals to eat more lick. And it's a great way to regulate the amount of phosphorus that an, an animal's consuming in a diet because uh, that's the ingredient we really need to get right in, in a particular lick. And we don't want them eating too much um, because we'll be wasting money and we don't want them to be eating too little because we'll be losing productivity. So salt's a very good regulator in, in, in that respect. Another ingredient that's often used is Gran Am, which is sulfate of ammonia. Um, and it's often used to regulate intake because it is quite bitter. So small amounts of Gran Am can be very effective for controlling intake. It's also used in conjunction with feeding urea. So some people are uh, put out uh, wet, wet season licks. Um, at the end of the wet season, they might add a little bit of urea into those licks. So Gran Am needs to be put into those licks with the urea because um, in order for the rumen microbes to be able to convert that urea into microbial protein, they also require sul sulfur as well. One of the other ingredients that's commonly put into licks is, is lime. Um, animals have um, a requirement for phosphorus, uh, calcium phosphorus ratio of 2 to 1 uh, calcium to phosphorus. Um, and often um, I'll come across licks that will have be nicely balanced for calcium phosphorus with a 2 to 1 ratio. The problem on a lot of our northern tropical pastures is that we've got extremely high levels of calcium, so the ratios are often running from 4 to 1 calcium to phosphorus to 7 to 1. Um, putting lime into the lick isn't going to cause a problem where phosphorus is adequate in the diet. Where it's going to be a problem is when the animal is actually phosphorus deficient, and we're putting a lot of lime into the lick. Um, and that, that extra calcium that's in the lime will get flushed out of the body, and along with it, it'll flush out some of the phosphorus as well. Um, furthermore, the other issue that it's going to cause is that if there's too much calcium going into the diet where there's a phosphorus uh, deficiency, it'll actually prevent the animal from mobilizing phosphorus from its bones. So, too much lime in a supplement can actually exacerbate a phosphorus deficiency where a phosphorus deficiency exists. Uh, some people use um, lime to harden, harden their uh, supplements during the wet season and prevent wastage, but it would probably be a better alternative um, where possible to provide some sort of shelter for the lick so that it doesn't get rain damaged. And I know that um, on some properties that would involve making a lot of shelters but um, it certainly would be worth considering. Um, cement is also sometimes used in, in, uh, in supplements during the wet season, and we strongly recommend that people don't put cement into supplements because they can contain a lot of impurities, and it just increases the risk of those impurities turning up in the offal. So um, putting cement in is definitely not a good idea. In some of the coastal areas, uh, stock, um, getting getting adequate intake of phosphorus in cattle um, is, is a bit difficult, uh, just using phosphorus and, and salt. So some people need to resort to putting molasses or uh, dried molasses, such as talibind or protein meal into the lakes, just to lure stock onto phosphorus supplements. So if they're not eating phosphorus, it, um, it doesn't mean that those animals don't have a phosphorus deficiency. Um, they certainly will go for phosphorus if they have an acute deficiency, or go for lick if they have an acute deficiency. But um, where it's, there is an acute, an acute deficiency, um, it could be because the lick just simply isn't palatable enough for the animals to eat. Uh, one of the problems in the past was that um, uh, there were a lot of rock phosphates that were being supplemented to animals. So 
some of these were being imported. And the problem with some of these rock phosphates was that they contained uh, a lot of heavy metals, such as ca cadmium and, and fluoride. Uh, those rock phosphates are no longer registered for livestock feeding. Uh, but we still have issues with high fluoride levels in, in some of the bores. And in these two maps, um, I've only included those bores that had relatively high fluoride levels. So the little dots, uh, little yellow dots, those are bores that have a fluoride ratio uh, level of two to three parts per million or um, milligrams per liter. Uh, that's becoming a, a borderline fluoride level. And certainly, if they're um, flowing bores and you get evaporation, the, the fluoride level will become greatly concentrated for those particular levels. But where the uh, fluoride levels run above three, it certainly creates a problem for the animal. Fluoride gets absorbed into the same binding sites as phosphorus, and it's absorbed much more readily than, than phosphorus is. So trying to counteract high fluoride levels in boars by supplementing phosphorus isn't going to work. So I certainly recommend that uh, young growing animals, first calf cows, all of those animals that have very high phosphorus requirements aren't put into paddocks where there are higher uh, boar fluoride levels. And certainly, if you can avoid putting them onto those boars with high fluoride levels, that's strongly recommended. Alternatively, if you don't have much, uh, much of an option, um, then I strongly recommend rotating animals around so they're not exposed to those boars for too long a period of time. John, I'll just stop there. Great. OK. Thanks, Desiree. So yes, we do have a few questions. So going back a little bit, um, should you still vaccinate for botulism if you're feeding phosphorus? Uh, ab absolutely, uh, because we can't guarantee that all animals are going to be consuming phosphorus. We get huge variability in, in animals that um, uh, consume phosphorus or under-consume phosphorus compared with animals that are over-consuming it. I mean, we always work on averages, uh, but there are always groups of animals that just simply won't touch a supplement. So we need to be able to protect them. And animals will also chew bones if they become protein deficient. So um, I, I often get um, phone calls from people who, on Downs Country, for example, um, where I know that the phosphorus levels on those particular properties it is adequate. And they'll say that the cattle are chewing bones. And this is usually um, well into the dry season. Um, and that's usually because the animals have become protein deficient. So they'll chew bones if they're protein deficient, and they can get botulism that way. And there's certainly been a lot of cases on country, even where phosphorus is adequate, that animals have, have got botulism. So I strongly recommend that people continue with the vaccination. Great. OK. Thank you. Uh, the next question is regarding fecal testing during the wet season. How large a sample is required, and how many? OK. Um, uh, I recommend taking uh, a tablespoon from uh, 10 to 20 animals. Make sure that the sample is, is reasonably fresh, um, and that, that being a couple of hours old, for example. Um, you can still sample then. The problem during the wet season is that dung beetle activity is, is uh, fairly vigorous. And um, it's important to um, only collect samples from cow pats where there hasn't been dung beetle activity, because uh, the beetles tend to contaminate the samples a bit with soil. And that will cause high ash levels when you, when you get your test done, if you're doing it in conjunction with a diet quality analysis. So you'll get over predictions of protein and energy. So in, in, make sure there's no dung beetles. Make sure there's no soil contamination. Uh, ensure that the animals um, are of all, all of the same class of stock. And uh, make sure that they haven't been on supplements for, for a week or two. OK, good. Now, we're running out of time, so just one last question. Will high levels of natural calcium carbonate in the stock drinking water have a detrimental effect on phosphorus intake or utilization? Um, it won't have a detrimental effect on phosphorus intake in, in, in that um, you know, the animals will continue to, to um, consume the phosphorus, but it, it certainly can um, interfere with the absorption of, of the phosphorus if there's too much calcium going into the diet, but only where there's an existing phosphorus deficiency. So where animals are, are pee adequate, then it won't pose too much of a problem. But I certainly would, um, certainly would get a test done. 
Great. We've only got a um, short period of time left, so back to you now, Desiree. Okay. Uh, this last segment is, is more about um, more about how, how we can capitalize on, on feeding phosphorus to our animals, so taking a bit of a holistic approach and some of the other things that are worth considering as well as the economics. Oh, John, I think you got a poll uh, yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, so about four years ago the cost of phosphorus went up, so the question is, uh, when it did go up, did this affect your feeding of phosphorus supplements to your cattle? So yes, no, or maybe? Great, I can see most people have it there now, so I'll close it off in three, two, one. Okay, so Desiree, over half the people have said no, um, and then about equal numbers, about 20% said yes and maybe. Okay, well that's, um, that's really interesting and I hope that some of these economics will um, convince you that uh, there is a return to uh, feeding phosphorus um, even when the prices are, are quite high. Okay, and as I just mentioned, um, when, when the phosphorus prices went up to about $1,800 to, to $2,000 um, a ton, uh, the work that was done by Bill Holmes, who was an economist with, with our department for a good number of years, had shown that there was still um, quite a significant return. So anywhere uh, between a threefold to sixfold return on, on um, supplementing phosphorus to those animals when phosphorus was quite expensive. Now the case studies that we've got in the book have shown that the return uh, per adult equivalent, so an adult equivalent being a 450 kilogram dry animal, it increased anywhere between 12 to 23 percent. And that's going to vary um, depending on, on a few different things, such as how well um, other aspects of um, management are going with, with a particular property. So if other aspects of management um, are up to scratch, then the return from supplementing phosphorus is going to be higher. Um, if there's other areas that require improvement uh, in the management of those animals, then the return is going to be somewhat less. If we've got really high running costs for a particular property, and one of our case studies has shown that up, at, up in the Cape, where they had extremely high running costs, um, the return is a little bit lower, but they still showed a 12% return on, on uh, feeding phosphorus to those animals, and also the productive capacity of the country. So the, the greater the produ productive capacity of the country, uh, um, not looking at the, um, the phosphorus status, um, then obviously that the greater return from supplementing phosphorus to those animals as well. So just to give you an example um, that, um, that Bill had, if we're looking at um, um, a property Um, and in this particular case, he was looking at um, um, two mobs from the same property where um, stock were fed dry season supplements in both cases, and one group was fed a wet season phosphorus supplement, and the other group wasn't. Um, first of all, we had to adjust for the animals that were being fed the phosphorus supplement because obviously they were going to show a higher feed intake during the wet season. So the adult uh, equivalent had to be, or the number of animals had to be uh, dropped back by 10%. Uh, Sears returned off a year earlier in the, in the group that was wet season fed. Um, there are obviously additional labor costs, a vehicle costs for putting out lick, and capital expenditure that needed to be accounted for as well for feeding during the wet season. The gross margin per adult equivalent came out uh, as being this, so where animals weren't receiving a wet season phosphorus supplement, um, the return was $57, and where uh, wet season phosphorus supplementation was being um, provided, um, the return was $103. And this is being done um, carrying fewer animals, so the cost of dry season supplementation in the, in the mob that was fed during the wet season obviously was going to be lower as well. So there were savings all around and animals were turned off. And there was obviously increased cash flow due to surplus females being turned off from the property. So 
and to maximize the economic benefits from supplementing phosphorus, um, botulism vaccinations highly recommended. Um, we also recommend that um, matching calving with diet quality is, is also um, done because um, this is when females have their highest requirements. So we want them to be on the best quality pasture at the time, and and, uh, and that's going to save a lot of money as well and also improve reconception rates. Selling off any surplus cows, so taking the pressure off country, uh, feeding phosphorus is a bit like feeding urea. It's going to increase feed intake of the animals, so we need to reduce the number of animals uh, running on the country to um, lighten grazing pressure on that country. Using fetal aging and, and segregating females, so um, uh, running animals, females that are going to be calving before um, January, uh, separate to those animals that are calving uh, after after um, January or in the new year, um, just allows for a more strategic supplementation of those animals before Christmas that are um, going to have higher requirements because they're heavier in calf or they're starting to lactate. Um, early weaning, we often use that to take the pressure off a breeder um, to uh, prevent her uh, dropping in condition score, but it also helps to prevent that extra drain on um, phosphorus, uh, leaving that female to produce milk for the calf. And that's going to allow us um, to put some phosphorus back onto that female um, while the feed quality is still reasonably good, so that she, her bone phosphorus reserves are going to be replenished prior to the next wet season. Culling non-performers, so getting rid of all the the cattle that are parasites on the property that are just eating grass, um, eating lick and looking pretty and not actually um, doing anything for the property. So getting rid of those animals, um, that will go towards funding the cost of uh, wet season supplements in particular. And matching animal requirements with paddock diet quality. And just to give you an example, um, there was a property earlier this week that I, I did a diet quality report for um, up, up in the Gulf. And, and they had two paddocks that were fairly contrasted in terms of the diet quality. And it turned out that the first calf cows were running in the poor paddock, and the, the more mature cows were running in the paddock with higher diet quality. If those first calf cows remain in, in the paddock with the poor diet quality, they'll require an energy supplement, uh, where if they were swapped around between paddocks, um, their phosphorus requirement would be lower, and those uh, females could be fed a urea-based lick as opposed to an energy supplement, so that's going to save the property a bit of money. So there's ways and means of doing things without necessarily resorting to expensive licks um, straight away, um, and it, it just allows us to reduce our, our um, phosphorus and overall lick feeding costs just um, by managing the pasture and knowing what the diet quality is like in, in the different paddocks on the property. Uh, some of the future research that was identified in the phosphorus lit review that was done by David Coates and Rob Dixon, we're looking at uh, the effects of phosphorus supplementation on fecal pea levels. At the moment, um, we haven't got um, accurate uh, fecal pea results when animals are being supplemented with phosphorus, and this is why we tell people to ensure animals are off pea supplements when a uh, fecal test, a fecal sample is taken, uh, because it does interfere with the accuracy of the results. Um, looking at the, the knowledge of the carryover effects of phosphorus supplementation, and also the efficacy of dry season supplementation of phosphorus on bone repletion in breeders. So uh, while there has been some research to show that uh, we don't get, even though there isn't a production response from supplementing phosphorus to animals, um, there has been some research in South, South Africa that has shown that, um, that feeding phosphorus during the dry season can uh, cause some uh, phosphorus absorption in the bone. So that's an area that n requires further research. Um, prediction of phosphorus intake from fecal measurements, um, so we can get some idea of how much the animals are actually consuming. And also um, revisiting the on-property demonstration sites. So years ago, we had quite a number of producer demonstration sites that were funded by MLA across properties um, that were phosphorus deficient to show the benefits of phosphorus supplementation, but um, quite a number of properties have changed hands since then, and it is time to try and revisit that. Um, the other issue is to look at um, doing some work to identify, you know, what are the key drivers that 
um, will motivate people to implement phosphorus supplementation. Um, the economic benefits have been clearly defined, and it shows that there's a huge benefit from wet season phosphorus supplementation where there is a deficiency. Um, but um, you know, if, if money was the motivator for everybody, um, not just with supplementing phosphorus, but in a lot of things, then we'd be doing all those things um, to, to earn an extra dollar. So uh, one of the areas that um, we're keen to try and look at is what are some of the other things w that will actually get, get people to increase uh, adoption of wet season phosphorus supplementation in, in particular. Um, if you want to get a copy of the book, um, you can download it from the MLA website. Um, and just go into publications, and that's on the screen now. Or you can uh, send an email to MLA and ask for a hard copy to be sent. Or you can um, either get in touch with me, or you can either get in touch with me or, or your local beef extension officer. So on the Future Beef website, uh, if you click on contacts, it'll have a list of all the beef officers in Western Australia, Northern Territory, and Queensland, and it'll have a bit of a background on those officers, so you you know who that who you're dealing with. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, John. Great. Okay. Thanks, Desiree. So just one quick question: um, Have you looked into the free choice feeding of individual minerals so as to allow animals to adjust intake to their needs? Um, John, that work was um, done years ago at Swans Lagoon, uh, where they were actually looking at animals being allowed to select from different supplements um, as a means of uh, determining, uh, working out whether those animals actually knew what, what supplement they would actually require to meet their deficiencies. And the work showed that they can't really select what they require when they have a specific deficiency. Um, it's more likely that, um, I mean, when animals are phosphorus deficient, they, they will show depraved appetite and they will eat all sorts of things when they have a deficiency. And certainly if there's a phosphorus supplement in front of them, they'll get stuck into it. Similarly, if animals are salt deficient, you might see them licking soil. Um, so you, you might see a bit of depraved appetite, but uh, they don't have that ability to specifically seek out those nutrients that they're deficient in um, from a choice of different um, supplement mixes. Okay, thanks Desiree. Well, folks, we'll hold it there. So Desiree, thank you so much for your presentation today. You've done a great job summarizing that 50-page book for us all. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now, folks, um, don't forget to visit our Future Beef website because that's your one-stop shop for beef information across Northern Australia. In due course, you'll find the webinar recording under resources and then multimedia. Um, but as I said earlier, I'll send everyone who registered an email with the direct link. Uh, within the next day or so. And folks, while you're still at the website, don't forget to click over here on sign up because that way you'll be able to receive our e-bulletins that will tell you about future webinars too. Now, um, I'm pleased to announce that our next webinar uh, is going to be about wet season spelling in just a few weeks' time. So join Dione Walsh from the NT department and Ross Peatling from NAPCO on Thursday the 13th of December and that will be an evening webinar. And how do you register? Well, of course, you come over to the Future Beef website and you can click on our event calendar, find the appropriate date, and then um, it'll give you the information that you need. Now, of course, we'll be asking you uh, for your feedback on today's event. We'll be using an online survey, so as to say paper and postage. So please take a couple of minutes to complete that when I send you the email later on. So folks, that's all for today. Um, if you do have further questions for Desiree, you can um, email her directly or phone her, and I'll include those contact details in that follow-up email as well. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank Desiree on behalf of the group that's joined us today for sharing her insights with us, and a big thank you to all our attendees for coming along and interacting with us today. It's been great to have you with us. So all the best until we meet again. Hooroo now. <laughs>